Professor Ron Penny, in charge of immunology at the time, came back from a conference over in Haiti and presented to the board that there was this disease and it was quite rampant, it had been discovered over there and it would come to Australia. And he felt that St Vincent's Hospital Sydney needed to be alerted to this and it was called HIV AIDS. And uh, it was very severe and it was killing people. So he said the board needed to make a decision and they needed to make a decision pronto. And, and the ethos of the hospital was such that there was just really no questioning that I became aware of as to whether this is something we should do. It was something that clearly we, we had to do. St Vincent's was in the epicentre of where it was all happening, you know, no question. And to a degree still is, and we often spoke about where does HIV live in New South Wales? It's probably in two or three postcodes in the eastern suburb of Sydney. And hey, guess what? St Vincent's is slap bang in the middle of that. So we're not sure when many of our cases were infected, but I think we do know that in Australia now, there are well over 50,000 men, mainly men and some women, who are carrying the virus, uh, who in time carry a significant risk of developing AIDS. In 1984, I was one of the first group of people to be diagnosed with HIV. Uh, so it was pretty devastating because back in that, those days it was a death sentence. So you were told you were HIV positive and you are going to die. We were always behind the eight ball, right? So there were, uh, there were always too few beds and too many patients who were, who were sick. The Sisters of Charity at the time were very brave to insist uh, that patients should be, uh, should be cared for here according to the philosophy of the sisters in the provision of health care to people no matter how they, how they became ill. In those days the word homosexual was unmentionable still almost. People didn't talk about it, it was something that you didn't discuss. And so a lot of our patients had parents who, who just, they had to come to terms with the fact that their sons were dying and that their sons were gay. There was never a big sign up there which said AIDS unit or immunology department or so on and so forth. So that um, if a person's, if, if a, a member of a person's family actually walked onto the ward, they wouldn't be greeted with a big sign which said, welcome to the AIDS unit. So if you like, we weren't accidentally outing the patient um, before they'd had a chance to have a word with, with their family about it. It was extremely important uh, to have an organisation uh, founded by a religious order come out and be completely non-judgmental and uh, in many senses completely Christian, uh, the real meaning of Christianity in their approach uh, to this disease. There was a huge amount of discrimination in the healthcare sector itself. Uh, people were often denied or refused service or treated in a, an offhand or very discriminatory way. And so just to have a facility like the ward, the St Vincent's ward, which was completely non-judgmental, I think set a very powerful example for the rest of the health system, which um, can't be underestimated. I mean, in some hospitals uh, back in those days, people would not even be prepared to enter the room of a person with HIV or AIDS and leave their, their meal tray. They were left outside. It was a very, very difficult time. And I think key to all of this was that our attitude was non-judgmental. Our at attitude was one of loving the person and no judgment, no condemnation, but to train people up. We had nothing to treat the virus with, so we could treat the complications, we could treat the symptoms that the patients were suffering to varying degrees, but we had nothing to reduce the virus and to you know, improve patients' outlooks. So it, it was... Um, a very um, frustrating, I suppose, time.
I had no idea what I was about to come across. Um, I'd had a lot of experience in haematology and dealing with very sick patients, but uh, the AIDS epidemic was a whole new story. And we had, uh, we had lots of patients who were reasonably well, thank goodness, um, but we had lots of patients who had end-stage disease and they were terribly sick and they were wasted, uh, they were chronically unwell, they had multiple health problems, uh, many of which were difficult to treat. On many occasions you'd try and treat one problem and you might get some success with that but then another problem would get worse in the meantime or the treatment would, would bring about side effects which might make um, the quality of life for the patient much worse. I remember people dying on the day they arrived. Um, and, and, and quite um, dramatically, not, I think most people have a concept of death that's coloured by the movies, you know, just lying back in the pillow, tell mummy I love her. It wasn't like that. And then you had those people who were on the ward who were prepared to work with a, a patient group and a demographic that was very much on the margins. They may not have been in the margins in Darlinghurst, but they were very much on the margins everywhere else. And um, so they um, came because they wanted to care for their own and uh, people they identified with and look after them. And so they were a fabulous group of people to work with. People used to say, why are you touching your patients all the time? You know, why are you holding their hands and stroking them? And why are you... Well, the reason that we were doing that was to demonstrate very clearly, one, what was necessary and what wasn't necessary in terms of infection control and personal protective equipment, but also to demonstrate to the people that we were looking after that they were worthy of this touch and that they were worthy of this connection. And this was about... Um, humanness and I think that's what's being described as very compassionate approach to the care that we were given. It was the best of times and the worst of times and it's hard to put into words uh, what it was like. I mean for me I was all of 22, 23 years old uh, and 20 years ago when I started on the ward, uh, it was before uh, the new highly active antiretrovirals started to uh, take effect. And so we had very young men and, and young women who were getting very sick very quickly and who were dying. Uh, and so, you know, to be part of the community, to be uh, working with people my own age uh, who were getting sick, that yeah, was a tough gig. The mortuary was something that comes back. <laughs> that was traumatic. Um, I think in those days, um, nurses at St Vincent's, not in all hospitals, but here at St Vincent's, um, it was considered, well, you know, if you were nursing someone, then you, you hadn't finished caring for that person until you had taken them from the ward and made sure that they were taken down to the mortuary. And you'd fill out the book and you'd always write, rest in peace next to it. And that became very difficult over time. I could easily, conservatively, guesstimate that I probably held a couple of hundred uh, people as they died. And I walked alongside thousands, I would imagine, by right now. Um, and a, a lot of, in, a, in very isolated, traumatic, difficult experiences. If after the opening of 17 South, I'd say that the next biggest thing was uh, the hospice at Sacred Heart. But I think the um, strongest and a horriblest memory for me is being with someone who was dying and their partner would be there. And the unspoken question of, well, who's going to look after me? Because he'd be seeing uh, a, a almost future cinematic experience of what was going to befall him in, in the very near future. And, uh, you know, that was really difficult. There was one particular uh, day when it was all getting far too much for me. 
um, because at that time I think I'd just lost, in that week, I'd lost three of my guys. Um, so um, coming up onto the ward one day, I can't remember what triggered it, but I, I literally just burst into tears on, 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 on the ward. I just um, lost it completely. And Sister Margaret took me into the side room and just sat there and basically just held my hand and, and was with me through that period. And, and that, that meant so much for me. And I'm actually beginning to tear, to tear up my legs as I'm speaking about that. So, um, yeah, that 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 kind of w was that I, I guess symbolises the kind of the type of support, the type of emotional support that we gave to each other. It was Christmas Day, and I was doing my rounds in the hospital, and this very very ill man, um, in, in in his isolation, he said, "I'd love." I said to him, "Would you love?" a little bit of champagne with your lunch. He said, I would love a little bit of champagne. So he and I in a pyrostyrene mug had this little bit of champagne where we just toasted each other. And he was all alone. He, 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 he didn't come from Australia either. And he was all alone, didn't have any family or visitors. And, and I, I did, I often thought over that time, um, what would Mary Aiken head? She would have a smile all over her face to see how we cared for these people, but also for their families. I remember one of the one of the young nurses who's still around the hospital, actually, Brett, uh, and he took my father aside and um, took him away and sat him down and just talked him through the whole HIV, AIDS thing. And my father said to me, on numerous occasions afterwards how much that helped him you know at that, that really difficult time so I mean it, it's just one of the things that stuck in my mind that you know the, these wonderful staff not only were they giving me fabulous care but I mean they were, they were very compassionate in the way they treated my family at a, at a very difficult time. It was very early days of the unit and Aldo was in um, room one and, and he was a vibrant um, Chilean or South American man and, 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 and quite advanced in his disease. And, um, and I went in, he called me in, Bill, 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 he says, come in, come in, come in. And I said, oh, what is it, Aldo, what is it? Because you're thinking, what do they need from me? He said, feel my back, feel my back. He was as skinny as, you know, and his big smile like the Sydney Harbour Bridge, you know. And, um, and I said, yes, yes, your back is, is you're very thin and, and your shoulder blades are are sticking out because I thought that's what he was sharing with me is his distress at the weight loss you know because that's the bones used to stick out and he says no 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 he says those aren't my shoulder blades and I says what do you mean he says those are my wings I said what do you mean your wings he says they're growing it won't be long now and I just oh I just thought boy, you sh... Because, you know, in the past you would say, oh, no, no, don't talk like that, or, you know, oh, no. And I thought, oh, that is... You are so grounded in the reality of this experience, and you've given me a gift. You've, you've made it real for me. There is a perception that it could possibly have been dark all the time, but it was also a very funny place to work as well. Like, the the humour and, and the, there was often sort of moments of great joy as well, you know, very funny, you know, I mean, working with gay men, it's just like, you know, their sense of humour is just totally off the wall. And then, and then on the other side of that, you're working with, with nurses who are working in a very stressed environment and <clears throat> it's kind of pretty well known that, that we develop a fairly healthy but sort of robust sort of sense of the macabre humour that comes out of that. There was a wonderful nurse called Rose who had been looking after various friends of mine and she had a marvellous black sense of humour and she was down the other end of the ward and she saw me being wheeled in she said, ah, I've been waiting for this moment for a long, long time. I remember one day there was a uh, a request form came in with a blood sample from a from a doctor, and you know we 
they'd often write some clinical history on the on the and and there was one there was one uh, occasion where someone had written um, that for risk factors lives next door to hairdresser. Another good thing about the ward is of course that the the atmosphere the uh, the caring approach enabled people who were sick in this hospital very sick sometimes dying to be themselves to relax and be themselves and to feel comfortable in the environment with their friends and with partners and that sort of thing and you know some of these were colorful characters drag queens leather men <laughs> dance boys <laughs> party boys all of that um, so a lot of them went out with a bang. The community used to organise fundraising nights, um, primarily um, at DCM, and we had sort of good connections with the community. And so, um, uh, you know, all the all the sort of entertainers, drag queens, generally, <laughs> ninety percent of them would get together and put on um, donate their time and and um, uh, raise funds for the ward. And I think that. It was a great community kind of event um, and the nurses would actually put together a show themselves and so we'd, I'd organise, I, I, I knew a couple of choreographers, um, Ramon Doringo of, of, of kind of like City Dance Company fame, I mean he came along and um, I think Penny Clifford at some point came in, um, they all came in and helped us with their choreography, all donated and so we'd do a bit of a show. It was a very compassionate atmosphere and, you know, I mean, they were very relaxed about visiting ours. I mean, I remember taking friends that were visiting from New Zealand into, into seeing dying friends, you know, at midnight. They didn't mind, you know, <laughs> it was cool. You know, I remember taking patients in wheelchairs uh, with some of the nurses down to Mardi Gras to watch the parade. Um, I remember the BGF Easter Bunny coming and uh, and visiting the ward. Uh, I remember, you know, uh, just a spontaneous party would erupt uh, on the ward. Uh, and I also remember being so uh, excited uh, and the whole team so excited when patients were able to go home. One of the high points of the whole episode was the support that we had from the, uh, the sisters and the hospital administration, as well as uh, the governments of the day, uh, and being able to set things up and fund, get appropriate funding to, to look after these patients. We knew that we had to expand our immunology department. Uh, I remember that uh, through Ron's good efforts, we received a $1 million donation for that from the Australian Cancer Foundation which was headed by his very good friend Sir Peter Abels and I well remember a meeting that I had with Ron when we met with um, uh, the then Premier Neville Rand and we received two million dollars uh, towards the establishment of the new the Immunology Centre and we received we had fundraising activities to raise money to expand that. As my time on the ward increased, we started to see more antiretrovirals um, come through. And then finally in the mid 90s, when we saw the protease inhibitors come along, we saw people who'd been almost moribund um, suddenly you know, start to improve, get some quality back into their life. And so that was really wonderful to see the people who'd been occupying the beds for weeks on end, then returning in quite a short time out, coming into outpatients and we didn't see them anymore in the ward and that was wonderful. I think the end result has been extraordinary. We now have medicines that, um, uh, that have turned this fatal condition into a um, uniformly fatal condition into a, a chronic manageable disease in which people can live a um, a normal life expectancy. Seeing the care and the compassion of my colleagues to the patients and the, uh, the gratitude and, and the courage of the patients, uh, it really in that respect was an amazing time um, and it was a privilege for me to have worked and survived through that time uh, and now it's fantastic uh, to have patients who are now on combination drugs that are keeping them well who, who recall the, the bad old dark days and we often have a joke about it, have how things have changed so dramatically. You know, what we're celebrating now is 30 years of the opening of the AIDS ward 
but I would sort of say in a way that one of our greatest achievements, um, not as a hospital, but as, as a sort of globally, has been the fact that we don't need AIDS wards anymore. The technology we have available is fantastic. And the beauty of having developed it all for, for HIV, we, we can now apply that technology to, to other areas like, you know, viral hepatitis, for example sexual health in other, for other diseases, the viral load test, molecular testing for diagnosis of infants, enormously helpful technologies. HIV research uh, and ongoing treatment continues to be a priority for St Vincent's. We're doing some really exciting work, uh, not just uh, in the interface with uh, immunology and virology, uh, but in trialling new drugs, uh, in uh, post-exposure uh, prophylactic treatment, uh, but also looking at new and emerging uh, treatments for people with HIV. So for example, uh, we've got a very strong program looking at uh, anal cancer and the work that we can do with people with HIV in diagnosing uh, patients who might be at risk uh, early so that there is uh, treatment uh, and uh, cure for their disease. But people with HIV are also living longer and so issues around ageing are coming to the fore as well. And so we're also working very hard around what are some of the new treatments and, and the issues for people who are older who have HIV. Uh, so we'll continue to be doing this work and it continues to remain a very important service for St Vincent's.